In 2 Corinthians 3.7, Paul makes a claim that nearly shatters his image in the eyes of the Jewish community when he refers to the law written on stone as a ministry of death. He asks the question, if that law that was the ministry of death and written in stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at the face of Moses because of its fleeting glory, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? But you know, it really doesn't matter what he said after he used the words ministry of death concerning the covenant, which was the Ten Commandments written in stone. What people heard was that Paul just called the Old Covenant a ministry of death. What would cause him to use such a negative connotation toward the very laws written by the finger of God? One has to wonder. Yet today many Christians don't understand it while others try to ignore it or explain it away. But what do the scriptures say? Paul also refers to the law in Romans 4, 15 through 16 when he says, For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. In Romans 7, 5, he says, For when we lived according to the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our bodies, bearing fruit for death. So what's all this talk about death? How can the law that David calls perfect be a minister of death, bringing wrath, bearing fruit for death? Many groups that call themselves Torah observant have a really hard time defending these passages. So instead of acknowledging that the law of God did bring death, they reduce this term law to mean the laws that were added to the original law of God. But we need to be honest with the scripture and honest about God and Israel, the firstborn son. Before the law was given, there were many sins that were not punishable by death. In fact, Paul himself says that sin existed before the law was given, but sin is not taken into account when there is no law. That's pretty self-evident when we look at the Old Testament. When we look at Israel before Mount Sinai and after, we get a clear picture of just what Paul means by the law bringing wrath and death and producing fruit for death. Israel is victorious over the Amalekites before receiving the law at Mount Sinai, but is defeated by them after. Moses doesn't complain about his burdensome dealings with the Israelites until Jethro points out the problems just before the law is given. As soon as he leaves Mount Sinai and is faced with the exact same problems, he asks God to kill him. On their way to Mount Sinai prior to being given the law, none of the Israelites are put to death for sin against God or against Moses, but after Mount Sinai, many thousands are put to death for the same offenses once they receive the law. For example, violating the Sabbath goes unpunished in Exodus 16. After the law, Sabbath breakers are put to death. Another example, Israel's longing for the delicacies of Egypt goes unpunished before the law. And after the law, the Lord strikes down many Israelites with a plague for the same sin after they receive the law. Another example is the people claim that it would have been better to die in Egypt before they were given the law, but don't actually get their wish until the law is given. Also, grumbling against Moses before giving the law results in no punishment in Exodus 16, yet after the law is given, grumbling against Moses results in the death of about 15,000 people. And again, people complain against God and Moses and get bit by fiery serpents. When we compare the before the law picture of Israel with the under the law picture of Israel, the implications are pretty clear. Thus, Paul expresses his understanding of the Torah in his New Testament writing when he articulates that the giving of the law resulted in divine wrath and death. He says, For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Moses was not presenting righteousness through the law as Israel's key to blessing and the enjoyment of the Promised Land. In fact, he promised that they would be disobedient, experience curses, and die in exile. Not a very happy picture. God even tells Moses in the final weeks in the wilderness just before his death, You are going to rest with your ancestors, and these people will soon prostitute themselves with foreign gods in the lands they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. The fact is, the Israelites spent an entire year on Mount Sinai with God and seeing the miracles, the fire, the smoke, the thunder, the lightning, and even God's voice. And yet time and time again we read about how Israel did not have faith. Even Moses and Aaron are not permitted to enter the Promised Land due to their own lack of faith. If the purpose of the law was to produce faith, then I hate to say it, but it did a poor job. But honestly, that seems to be part of the plan. The law was always pointing to the Messiah, a true propitiation for sins, and was never going to accomplish righteousness in Israel or anyone else. One might say, not murdering is righteous, that's a good law. True, but doing a righteous act or not doing an evil act does not create in one a state of righteousness. Yet Abraham, who was 430 years before the law, was a righteous man and a friend of God. It was his faith that produced righteousness in him. Israel, on the other hand, is reminded time and time again that they do not have faith. 
The law does not provide faith. God gave the law to Israel knowing that they would break it and fail. So why the law? Paul answers this question too. Why then the law? It was added because of the transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made, and it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Obviously there were sins before the law was given by Moses, but for the most part there was little or no punishment for disobeying a direct command from God. Let's not forget that Cain slew Abel and was not given the death penalty, but was sent away. After the flood, God told Noah that murder was punishable by death, so that command was known by Abraham. But when a person walked with God and listened to his instructions for their lives like Abraham did, then the law of Moses was not necessary. So Paul gets it. Paul understands that the law did not accomplish righteousness, but actually produced more sin, as he said in Romans 7, 7 through 9. Because until the law of Moses, a lot of things that were not sin became sin after the law was given. Paul knew that the only way that man would ever be righteous is with the blood of Jesus and without the Mosaic law, but embracing the law of Christ. He says, to those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law, 1 Corinthians 9.21. The law of Christ is now the law of God, and that's why Paul says that he's not outside the law of God, yet he's following the law of Christ. Jesus taught us to love, love God, love our neighbor. Sounds simple, right? I think we all know it's much harder than we even imagine some days. The law given by angels through a mediator served its purpose. It kept Israel in a better place than the barbaric nations around them. It kept them in line. It gave them parallels to the Messiah prepared them for the coming of the Messiah by putting them in a state to even be able to follow the law of Christ, it took them out of the moral mud they were in when they left Egypt, and in its time it was perfect, which is why David loved it so much. But David did not understand the greatness that was coming through Christ, who would be the new covenant, because as much as David loved the law, it never produced faith for Israel. The Holy Spirit has produced faith in the hearts of the believers. I was recently on a path I called Torah keeping as if that were possible, but the more I studied the law, the more I realized I wasn't keeping it even though I was doing what everyone else who calls themselves Torah observant was doing. But worse, I noticed over time that my concern was more with the law than with Jesus. I used Jesus primarily to promote my view of the law, even though I never would have realized it then. I even tried to reinterpret things Jesus said so that they fit with my view of the law. I did the same with all of Paul's writings. I was getting more and more bitter and more caught up in knowledge over faith, and some of it was even false knowledge. Since I've rededicated my life to telling the beautiful story of how Jesus is the centerpiece of the entire picture in the Bible from Adam to eternity, I've been happier, healthier, and had a renewed sense of joy that I forgot for a couple of years of my life. I learned a lot. I learned things that God needed me to learn. So I don't think this journey was for nothing. During this time, I read the Old Testament more than once, and it taught me a lot about Jesus and about God's plan for Gentiles that I didn't see before. And I learned so many beautiful things about God's holy days and how Jesus has and will still fulfill things through them. But that was and will be God's doing, not because of any religion I belong to. The law does bring wrath and is a minister of death. That's a fact that Paul understood. But faith brings life. It's hard to live under the law of Christ and freedom. Freedom is hard to hold on to and even harder to keep ourselves in check, but that's why God gave us his spirit. I recently met a friend who had a similar story to mine, and she said, We are wired to be performance-based. That is why Torah observance appeals to our carnal nature. We are human, after all. She's right. But Jesus himself is the new covenant. When we put on Christ, as Paul says, we put on the new covenant. It's not letters in stone. It's not the covenant renewed that Israel broke, because... Those laws are not attainable. Even if we didn't consider the things that give us a deeper understanding of the law, like lust being equivalent to fornication or hate being equivalent to murder, at the base level, if we're really being honest with ourselves, we are going to covet. We are going to lie, steal, bear false witness at some point, even if by accident, which still required an atonement. Without Jesus as our new covenant and his blood as our atonement, we are worthy of death. We cannot attain righteousness under the law, and the only way we get into heaven is if we are righteous. We can put on the righteousness of Christ, or we can try to earn it on our own and end up failing. I'll go with Jesus, the new covenant. Will you?